Hi, everybody. I am so excited to introduce you to the lovely Sarah B. Ross, who coaches people who are ready to move beyond the shoulds into the coulds. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing today, honey? I am doing wonderfully. I am so excited to be here with you and to look at your gorgeous sparkly self and earrings. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do love dangly earrings and hats. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you become a coach for people ready to leave their shoulds? I have a feeling there's a personal story here. There, there is, and it's been full of surprises as life so often is, right? Yeah. So I've, I've spent my adult life uh, looking for a blend of self-employment because I'm very independent and I like to do things my way. Um, and so looking for that blend of self-employment and being a helper uh, that nurtured me instead of drained me. Mm -hmm. I tried some forms of being a helper as a, as a young adult that, uh, or a younger adult that just didn't work for me, that just really took it all out of me. And so I did this sort of swinging career arc into entrepreneurship without as overt a helper element. Yeah. And then I met a coach uh, locally, an executive coach who said, oh, you're a coach. Stop messing around. Go be a coach. <laughs> um, and after a couple of years of her prodding, I finally explored it. Now, when I first started coaching, though, I thought, um, and I say what I'm about to say with only self-love, I think you'll appreciate it. But when, when I started coaching, I thought, well, I'll coach other weirdos like me. <laughs> and I'll just have my great weirdo crew. And I have coached many a wonderful weirdo for sure. The surprise came in when I started getting hired by people who are much more mainstream, um, who looked at me and they've given me this feedback, who looked at me and said, okay, what, what uh, falls within my range of normal has not gotten me where I wanted to go. And you are outside of my normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call a backhanded compliment, isn't it? Right. <laughs> I just take it all because I like being a weirdo. So I'm like, yes, you're right. I am not your normal. Uh, Let's talk about that a little bit because yeah. I think of myself as weird. And Wonderful. You just identified yourself as weird. And a lot of my friends identify as weird, which I think basically means we don't play by the rules anymore. Yes. Except the rules that we make. Yes. Yes. So where do the rules that you play by come from now? What a fun question. Um, and my, my instinctive answer is um, play and intuition. So experimentation. Yes. Right? Let me see if this works for me. Okay, now let me check out how it went. Is it the same for you? Intuition. Yes. So it's like that didn't work. I mean, I spent many years in corporate America and I'm grateful for what it gave me. I'm grateful that I'm not there anymore <laughs> <laughs> because, well, I'm a Pisces. I'm the artistic kind. I'm, I'm your basic all around weirdo. And I love it. This is who I am. So the rules that I play by come mm -hmm. from inside now. They come from from the spiritual basis, which is what we're talking about in the 31 day good vibration challenge. Um, because that's where our happiness is too. Yes. You know, we'll, when, when did you first learn about vibration and the choice to be in a high or a lower vibration? You know, that's really pretty recent work for me. So, <clears throat> you know, historic, you know, in the scope of life. So I'd say, I've known about it for a long time. I was not open to it until my mid thirties. So five, six years ago or something like that. So I have sort of a classic in some ways, classic story in that I was brought up in a religion that happens to be Judaism and the religious aspects of Judaism didn't work for me. It was very um, angry and prohibitive and rule oriented the way I was taught it. And, um, and I globalized, right? We all globalize. Uh, what we learn, and in some instances, that's really useful. It's nice that we don't have to learn how to cross a street every time we come to a street. However, there are a lot of times that it doesn't serve us as well. So I, one of the globalizations that I did was to say, okay, well, I don't believe in spirituality or religion or anything like that. I'm just done with all of that. And that's how I lived for a long time. 
And then I, I happened upon an incredible group of women, right? How often is that a transformational yes, moment, system. right? <laughs> so yeah. I happened upon this just incredible group of women and they were so spiritual. And at first I was very hesitant. And then I thought, wait, this is something about this is clicking with me. It's working for me. And so I, I went to one of them in particular and I said, okay, I, I need to understand the spirituality thing. Can you explain it to me? Can you be my spiritual coach? Cause I don't even know what that word means apparently. Mm -hmm. And she threw her head back and she just laughed this beautiful, joyful laugh. And she said, Oh, honey, you're one of the most spiritual people I know. She said, you just <laughs> don't know it yet. <laughs> uh <-huh. clears throat> that's a, that's an important point, isn't it, Sarah? that we don't understand what spirituality really means. Yes. Because we have, in very few cases, separated from religion. Exactly. So she could see you, even though this wasn't something that you were actively putting out in the world. She could see that that was your basis for right. living. I was actively withholding, I thought. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that started a big shift for me. And how lucky was I to meet those women and, yeah. and, you know. Well, and this is something that it's important for us to remember. The universe wants to help us connect with our souls. And it's going to provide us many opportunities time and time again. So if we don't take it the first time, because that doesn't look like me, or that's not right, or no way. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is going to circle around until we're ready to see mm. yeah so that makes me think about um yeah it lenses exactly that that how we see so the lenses through which we're interpreting our experiences mm -hmm. um and our willingness and our ability to cultivate that willingness to find the juicy goodness that's presented to us you know presented to us time and time again right Right, the vibrations. My journey has been somewhat similar to yours. I was raised, uh, well, my granddaddy was a Presbyterian minister, and I always describe myself as a pagan who loves Jesus. <laughs> yes, I, do. I love Jesus, I love God, I love the Holy Spirit. And there was a point at which I needed to move beyond the organization, not the spirituality itself, not the relationship with the divine, but the, the way I expressed it in the world. Mm -hmm. So now life is way more fulfilling, it's way more challenging, and uh, lots more fun. Yes, yes. But I will say I've continued to, you know, as a, as a sister weirdo, I've continued to really play with, with that relationship and play is an important thing to me. Um, and so the language I like to use is, is the great big oneness right? yes. and, and the GBO. So I have my conversations with the GBO and, and in that I find that sense of um, connection to all things and also the sense of being very, very small in a way that I find comforting, you know, kind of like a little kid in, in, the arms of, a, of um, a trusted adult or something. And, and that's an important balance too, especially as we get bigger and put ourselves out more in our service to the world. Maintaining that privacy, that solitude, <clears throat> where we nurture the, the still small voice inside, as they used to say. But it is that place inside us that connects with something so much bigger than we are. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and, and it does require nurturing. You know, if we're always outward, then we start to feel drained. If we're mm -hmm. always inward, we start to feel isolated. So it requires mm -hmm. some balance. Yes, yeah, and, and again, I, I keep, my mind keeps going back to the word of experimentation, so. Mm -hmm. that, that dance, you know, that dance of, okay, I'm going to put myself out a little bit. All right, now it's time to bring it on back. <laughs> right? yes. yes, exactly. <laughs> How do you approach your clients to help them see where they've been blocked and where they can get bigger? 
You know, I play a lot in the world of um, gremlin voices, so the internal critic, and I, I find so much um, value in playing in discomfort. And I find that when we play in our discomfort and when we play with our gremlin voices, what we discover are a lot of assumptions that we make about ourselves, about life, about the meaning of success. Mm -hmm. Right. And in that way, we can just like, um, you know, finding a knot and a piece of string, we can start to tease that apart. Um, and in that find a new approach and um, hopefully a willingness to to bring some play and exploration into it. I love that phrase gremlin places. <clears throat> I've never heard it before, but it's it brings up an image immediately. And of course, those places that we call our gremlin places are places we have judgments. Absolutely. And one of the things that we spend our healing lives doing is undoing the tangles in the gremlin places that were put there by somebody else and that we adopted, right? Absolutely, 100%. <clears throat> So how do you coach your, your clients into shifting those gremlin places? How, how do they go into the discomfort and find the treasures? You know, um, I feel like there's, there's first um, the opportunity for acceptance. And, and so helping people find and nurture that acceptance. Um, I always butcher this quote, but Carl Rogers uh, said something along the lines of, the great paradox being that the more we accept ourselves exactly as we are, the more capable we are of change. Oh, um, so, that is a powerful one. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and so finding that acceptance of all the things, right? Of, okay, there's a part of me that says nasty things to me, a gremlin voice that says nasty things to me. There's a belief that's not serving me. I'm feeling discomfort around this mm -hmm. and, and accepting them as they are, right? As the feelings are, as the beliefs are, not believing them necessarily. So a parallel I like to use is um, to imagine a child getting out of bed and coming to you crying and saying, you know, I can't sleep, there's a monster in my closet. And how we can bring presence and compassion to that child without believing there's a monster. Yes. Right. And maybe even acknowledging the monster, maybe standing with the child to look at it and say, you know, this monster really is kind of pretty. Got different yes. color scales and <clears throat> it looks like it's growling, but it's smiling, you know, that sort of thing. Do or simply that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you do you find it always reminds me, I, I read somewhere that the dragon that's chasing you is actually trying to protect you. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. So I, I think, you know, the one point I want to make is, or, you know, one addition I'd like to add is, is accepting and loving the emotional reality, regardless of the physical reality, right? Okay. So the child, acceptance is essential yes. to change. I and think that so. includes, and maybe especially the emotional reality. So our feeling, exactly. our feelings are so critically important and that's what blocks us or moves us forward, right? I think so. I think so. And yet we tend to try to bury them, right? And we have a lot of judgment about our feelings. This is a good feeling or this is a bad feeling or I don't want to have this feeling, mm -hmm. right? Um, or this feeling is an indication that something wrong, you know, when sometimes it's not. Nothing's exactly. wrong. It's simply a moment of change or sort of natural, normal discomfort, right? And Yes, I think that is an important aspect for us to consider when we're on a healing journey is that the labels we put on something, we want them to be as accurate as possible. And just because something's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. Right. In fact, that's where the most growth is, right? I agree wholeheartedly. Yes. And do you find your clients when they go, how, how do they respond when they go into the, the gremlin places? You know, it's interesting to me. The first thing that 99% of people do is yell at the gremlins. The first oh, thing they say, man. and I think it's okay. You know, I think it's a step, you know, it's a stage, right? I certainly did plenty of it when I first uh, met mine. And so I, I like to um, encourage people to name their gremlin voices first so that we're, we have a, a personification. We have a way to conceptualize these feelings and these messages and assumptions and those kinds of things. 
Yeah. And so the first thing people do, they name them and then they go, and now I'm going to tell them I don't have time for them. And I go, great, let's do that. First, we're going to tell them we don't have time for them. And then we get some distance. And, and to me, that's part of the play. So, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to push them off and I'm going to get some distance. And then to me, we, we eventually, as we get into that place of acceptance, then we can evolve into a place where we can come to see them as a part of ourselves that needs some attention and some love and a hug, you know, a part of ourselves that's feeling fearful. Now, I can tell you a quick story about that for myself. Please do. So when I, when I first named my gremlin voices, the one that's the meanest, um, you know, who says you're not enough and you're not lovable and, you know, everybody knows you're a fake, but that voice, I named him Wampus. And I love it. It sounds like he's got like a caveman with a club or something. So right. I named him Wampus and I would do exactly what I just described. I'd say, Wampus, I don't have time for you right now. I'm busy. Right. And I, and I managed him that way for a while. Well, then one day, um, after maybe even a couple of years of this, I was in a meditation, a partnered meditation. And, um, and I saw Wampus for the first time. Really? What did you I see? Did. He was. Uh, Wampus is, now that I know what he looks like, he is this um, shaggy, sad, blue, like cousin it kind of thing. It's like cousin it and a Muppet had a, had a sad baby. Um, oh, and so he's, yeah, so he's blue and he's shaggy and he's scared. He's absolutely. very scared, right? And he wants to keep me safe and he doesn't know any way to keep me safe than to try to keep me small. Mm-hmm. And once I saw that, I was able to recognize that, um, that he was really coming from a loving place, not an angry place, mm -hmm. and that I could offer him compassion. And I could even listen to him. And that, in fact, it wasn't that 100% of what he said was wrong or bad or problematic. It was that he would take a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit of, of reasonable fear, usually, not 100% of the time, right? No, always or never. Um, but he would take a teeny, teeny, tiny little thing that was probably worth paying some attention to, and he would put it under one of those electron microscopes until it looked huge, <laughs> right? So instead, I could learn to say to him, hey, Wampus, I get that you're scared, and I'll pay attention, and I'll find that kernel of thing to pay attention to in the midst of this, this huge panic attack you're having, mm -hmm. but, I, but I'm not going to get into the panic attack with you. Good. Right? Now, see, that's an important thing because what you're also describing is being the witness or the observer to your own process. Yes. And this is one of the things that I think this is a skill that helps us keep our vibration high because then you can be compassionate with Wampus without going into the drama. Yes, right? absolutely. And okay. isn't that a wonderful, empowered place to be? We can go, oh, I see it all swirling, but I'm not going to swirl right now. I don't need to do exactly. that. Exactly. We get, we can observe it without participating in it. Mm -hmm. and that protects our energy. This is one of the, the skills that I hope that our, our players in this wonderful challenge will, will take advantage of just to try it out. This is an experiment in how we can make our lives happier, clearer, more connected, because that's what happens when you raise your vibration. Mm -hmm. um, the lower drama and the heartache, and you still feel things, but they don't control you. And you can manage when you're ready to deal with them. And just like when you so told Wampus, not right now, but then at some point you had to make time to spend with Wampus, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are certainly times, Barbara, when I have to find stillness because I am not in a place to have control of that situation. So for example, you know, a little while back, there was a, a dust up when, within my family and, um, and I could hear all the various voices, right? I've named several gremlin voices and I could hear them all chattering and I felt just rotten and terrible and uh, there was a lot of guilt involved in it. And there was this little voice of wisdom that I could hear just whispering in the background of all of this whirl and chatter and chaos that said, all you need to do is stay quiet for the rest of the night, get a good night's sleep. And when you wake up, everything is going to be a lot easier to manage. Mm -hmm. Right. And I literally did that. I sat on a porch 
you know, and I waited for the night to pass until I was tired enough to go to sleep. And I went to sleep and I woke up refreshed, but it's exactly what you're describing, which is being able to observe the whole process, mm -hmm. and make a conscious decision about how I was going to be in it and what it meant for me in that moment. Right. We have not been trained to feel in charge of our lives. And there is plenty outside us over which we have no control whatsoever. But we can learn to work with the, the heart, the feelings, and actually those, you know, are you familiar with the work of Greg Braden around um, what really is prayer? He's no. ancient manuscripts and he was a NASA scientist. So he's coming from the scientific into the spiritual and his research into the ancient traditions uncovered that the thing that the universe recognizes is our emotions. So we don't even have to have words if we want to pray. If we are feeling heart sick because of something that is going on on the planet, say something about the environment, some devastation, some loss of animal life that is irreplaceable. The, the love that we put into the universe in the grief, mm. in the pain and the loss, that love is what the universe recognizes as a prayer. Mm. In the same way with the, with the negative things that we really don't want in our lives, if we focus on them, that's the vibration that be, sends out its beacon, right? That's so cool. here's the homing signal. Do you mm -hmm. want to send out good stuff or do you want to send out, ooh, don't think that's going to feel very good. <laughs> Are you familiar with the meditative practice Tonglen? Yes, breathing in pain and breathing out love. Describe that for our listeners, please. Yes, I, you know, um, you just described it really wonderfully, which is, is exactly <laughs> that. It's, it's, it's um, a practice of coming from starting, typically starting with our own pain and discomfort as a way to connect with other people's pain and discomfort. Because when we stop and think about it, we can recognize that there is no pain or discomfort that we have or will experience uh, that hasn't also been felt by millions of others, right? Yeah. And it's a, a great connector, you know? And so um, when we can invite that in and accept it, then we can transform it within ourselves into love and send it back out as these cool waves of, of loving, generous energy, which I find to be one of the more visceral experiences I've ever had of that kind of energetic exchange. And that's a practice in which you can actually feel your vibration rising because you're, you're breathing in the pain, but you're acknowledging it mm -hmm. and you're transforming it as you send it out with love. Mm -hmm. um, I love the practice of, of um, Huna, the, oh. the Hawaiian tradition of Huna shamanism that has taught us Ho'oponopono which is very similar. Um, it is a, a constant chant of, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. Mm. Because the world is a hologram. Everything that we see around us is a hologram of something inside us. And when we do that, we're doing essentially Tonglen breathing as well. It's just a different language, which is another example of how there are a thousand ways to say something, but the underlying intention is the same. It's the intention to be connected, the intention to heal, the intention to be positive change in the world. And when we do that, our vibration automatically rises. We don't even have to think about it. <laughs> I also love how that illustrates the... Um the overlap of, of um, spiritual practices that when we, yes. when we look at it, it, right, they're recurring repetitive messages that show us the way and we don't have to be so um, divisive in terms of this, this belongs to this tradition and this belongs to this tradition, but rather mm -hmm. we are humans finding the routes to the same ideas of love and connection in whatever way work for us as individuals, right? And I think that's the work is to come into oneness and the way we come into oneness is by healing our own brokenness and reaching out to whoever's close to us but it's that connection 
-hmm. And once we realize, I mean, I love that you're a beautiful mirror for me, how I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. Authentic, being present, um, being compassionate and loving, being insightful as to the core issues that we're working with to change us from homo sapiens to homo angelicus. I love it. <laughs> I do too. And that's been one of the fun things for me in this 31 day good vibe challenge is I am getting to go to know deeper some of the most awesome people. And I want all of our listeners to, to, to know deep, deep in their souls. Celebrity is not what it's about. Fame is not what it's about. Money, certainly not what it's about. It's soul work. And that's mm -hmm. where our joy and our happiness is. How do you apply these concepts in the context of living right now with political upheaval, with economic upheaval, with environmental upheaval, with all the changes? How do you make change less frightening and more enjoyable? That's such a good question, especially these days. <laughs> yeah, it is for me too. I'm thinking about this all the time. Yeah, you know, in, in my work and in my life, I feel like I'm often toggling back and forth between the 30,000 foot view and the next centimeter. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and, and acceptance and experimentation and playfulness all come into this too. So asking myself very frequently, daily and multiple times a day, what is the best I can put into the world right now, given what I have to give? And sometimes that's, you know, something very small and simple, like staying calm or offering myself some self-love or smiling at somebody, mm -hmm. right? To me, all of those things are activism, especially are. smiling at other people. I think that that's critically important today in a way that I've never known it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, that simple act of connection and eye contact and, and mutual recognition. We never know fully the extent to which a simple compliment can change someone's day and maybe even their life. You know, something as simple as you look radiant in that color. You know, what a unique look. Um, mm -hmm. I needed to hear those words. Thank you. You know, that yes. kind of thing. <clears throat> that is an easy, it's almost effortless that once you learn to, to focus on the good stuff and you go mm -hmm. around looking for something honest that you can say positively about someone, mm -hmm. you, yourself, it shifts me. And I think it makes a huge impact on the people we speak to. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And so for, there are days when that is exactly the brand of activism that I'm living in. Every day there's a day like that. Every day I leave my house. There are days I don't leave my house. Um, <laughs> Me neither. Some days I hide it up. <laughs> um, and then there are some days when, you know, I have money to give and I give it. Or I have, you know, I have it in me to go march in the streets, which I do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and where my activism takes bigger, um, you know, enacts itself in, in more overt ways. Mm -hmm. um, every step along the way, though, there's, for me, there's also a telescoping out into this 30,000 foot view of reminding myself that humanity is on a trajectory toward the positive. Mm -hmm. We are on a trajectory in the biggest picture toward healing um, and toward kindness. And frankly, there are days when I, and this may sound a little dark, but it's very, very helpful to me. There are some days we're telescoping all the way out billions of years and recognizing that humanity is temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are all temporary. Um, and so putting my best in now is a, is a beautiful gift I can give to myself and to those around me and as it radiates out. And that there's nothing to panic about. Right? No. There's, at the end of the day, it's doing our best and, and, um, and releasing, letting go. You know, this, this yeah. hand gesture is really important to me that I'm not grasping, I'm not trying to control, but I'm simply doing my best and then letting go. Mm -hmm. I find that when I really go out far enough, like you're talking about where you're looking at the, the cosmovision, we'll say the mm -hmm. cosmic vision, 
everything takes everything is in cycles and we're passing through a cycle where we have mirrors for all the places we're wounded so that we can love them and heal them and then we have mirrors for places that we want to go mm. and that's where our choice is mm -hmm. talk a little bit about playfulness that's so important <laughs> playfulness is it is so important and in some ways i feel like it's very native to me and in some ways i feel like it's something i have to actively work at perpetually and what i what i found is that when i'm really wound up about something that that's my cue that i'm not being playful enough that i i'm taking something too seriously okay that was exactly the phrase that i was going to to comment on <laughs> too serious i mean save the world right <laughs> i do want to and i can't accept my little world mm -hmm. exactly and when we produce play we're we're looking for the joy we're looking for the things that put energy and passion into our moments mm -hmm. and we're making it worth the effort frankly yes, yes exactly uh, yeah <clears throat> where would you like to go in your own path you know um so I, I turned um, I turned 40 last year and um, <laughs> I love being 40. I, I have yet to hit a year that wasn't my favorite year yet though. Um, no matter how tumultuous the year is always my favorite year yet. Um, but it's been an interesting 40 is particularly interesting to me because when I was a, um, a depressed and, and uh, angst ridden teenager, I was positive that 40 was going to be this <laughs> end of the world amazing illuminated time when i'd know exactly who i was and what my purpose on this planet was and i just couldn't wait to be 40. and so when i hit 40 last year i thought okay let's let's have a little conversation with my teenage self is this what you expected and of course no i i expected much more certainty at 40 but i do have the peace that i expected and the it just came about in a different way and the peace that i feel and that I, that I want to live with and continue to evolve for, for the rest of my journey, as far as I understand it at this point, um, is the peace of accepting groundlessness and accepting my own perpetual learning curve and evolution, and that there's not a landing point, there's not an end goal to seek. There is simply an evaluating, for me, as I understand it now, is evaluating the best I have to give in this moment and how I can most fully enact what I have to give mm -hmm. and how I feel great, which are the same things, yes. right? I feel great when I'm giving what I have to give. It's so satisfying, isn't it? Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's the best. It, you can hardly wait to get up in the morning. <laughs> it's true, it's amazing to me. Yeah. And I do, I wake up every, every day thinking, wow, how did this become my life? This is how I get to live my life, this is wonderful. Which doesn't mean a lack of intentional evolution, right? I mean, we, we continue to set goals and move toward things and experiment. And that's, I'm writing a book now. That's a fun goal. But yep. it's the next step. It's just what I know to do now to continue to express what, what delights me and brings me joy and I think benefits others at the same time. I think that's true for all of us. And I think that is a huge point of wisdom and transformation is to understand that there's no place to get to the journey, the process, the more we invest in the process, the more we get back from it. And there's always more, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a good little Christian, I used to yearn towards heaven. And now I recognize heaven's here. Mm -hmm. Heaven's right here in my life right now. The joy of being on the planet, the joy of knowing, these fabulous people who are doing their work and making a difference in the world mm -hmm. and even the sadness even the grief even the loss of animal species i mean i started feeling more peaceful when i got a glimpse of how much bigger the divine plan is how much more layered and complicated than certainly history which is never trustworthy 
<laughs> history is never a trustworthy pattern to build your life on. And we're in a place that's so new, all we can do is experiment. Mm -hmm. And if we have fun with it, then we're playing fun games and the future's gonna have more fun and games. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always time for a dance party. That's <laughs> dance party, yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, what would you like, what would you like all the people listening to this discussion to take away for themselves? You know, I feel like one of the things that I see a lot is um, a lot of striving toward um, dichotomies, right? We want life to be simpler than it is, and we want to make right choices and, avo and avoid wrong choices. And we want to do good things and avoid bad things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, a, it's a damaging fallacy that holds us back, I think. You know, this, this idea when really one, we can't predict, right? We can't right. predict where our actions will take us. Um, and we're inevitably really choosing between groupings of opportunities and challenges. Right? There's no perfect path. There's no greener grass. There's, there's none of that. And I see it holding people back all the time. I see people not making decisions and not moving forward and not stepping into their own empowerment because they haven't figured out the quote unquote right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd love for people to take away is to notice when they are falling into that dichotomous thinking and to ask themselves, you know, based on what they know in this moment, which is inevitably incomplete, mm -hmm. what do they understand to serve them in this moment? And can they take that step, do that experiment, and then survey the environment from there, knowing that in the next step, they get to choose that step too. Yes. How do you encourage people to tap into their intuition and how do they know when they've done that? Um, Gosh, I, it's, I think there's such a subtlety to that, a really fun, uh, another fun place to experiment. I tend to think of um, our intuition as being, you know, from a neurological standpoint, I see our intuition as being our subconscious communicating with us. So everything that we have learned up until this point, bubbling up in a way that can feel magical when really it's, it's a, uh, thanks to all of our experiences and our studiousness and all of that in the past, right? It's sort of a, a gift from all of the efforts that we've already made. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this sort of gets me back into the gremlin voice idea though, because if I can pay attention to the nuances of the voices that arise in my head and I, and I get curious about it and I get studious about it, then it becomes easier and easier to discern which are the ones that are really fearful gremlin voices that are trying to keep me small for their idea of safety mm -hmm. and which are the ones that carry my most profound wisdom and my most profound connection to the GBO and um, so, that I can, so that I can attend to that one. Mm -hmm. And so I find that to be a quieting process, a being with process right? And noticing discomfort and bringing that curiosity in mm -hmm. um, and a visceral process, right? So uh, yes. I'm a big fan of inviting people to scan their bodies and, and invite, you know, in a very active way. Hey, I'm noticing a pressure in my chest. Hey, chest, if there's something you want to tell me, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. You or know, my stomach is tight. I feel nervous. Yeah. What is that about? And Absolutely. Is it, is it fear or is it excitement? Yes. Anxiety and excitement feel very similar in the bottom body, excuse me, <laughs> the body, but it's up here where the difference is. Yes. We can change that. Do you find <clears throat> that many of the people you work with have tended to trust their thoughts more than their heart brain? Oh you know, my gosh. The heart has its own brain. And the most powerful is when we combine the brain up here with the brain down here. Mm -hmm. and as I understand it, if you want to shift, all you have to do is touch your heart with intention. Mm. That yeah. activates the heart brain to work with the mind brain. Mm. 
How do you see that playing out with your clients? All the time. I, you know, the, these, these very mainstream folks who, who have become um, such a huge part of my life, um, they have become successful in the corporate American version of the idea of success. Okay. So we're back. We're back, and I've lost my train of thought. Oh, you were asking me about um, brains. Yes. Oh my gosh, I find that um, there is a so, I, I, it almost feels like fetishizing our brains to me. Sometimes we put so much trust into our intellectual selves. And I'm not, I'm not anti-intellectual by any stretch of the imagination. I think the intellect is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And yet, as you were saying a moment ago, there, we have other centers of wisdom within us that also need attention. Um, yeah, yeah, all the time. Um, and that sense of wholeness. And I think that these different centers sometimes relate to different ideas of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was saying that sense of wholeness, that sense of integrating all the parts of ourselves makes us stronger. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And gives us that direction that helps us through those obstacles that, um, that can't be teased apart through intellect alone. Yeah, and there's plenty of those. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's, I think, part of the wisdom we gain as we're learning is that um, the emotions that we choose to manage or not manage have a huge impact on our thoughts and vice versa. Mm -hmm. If we understand that connection, then we're also in a better position to be the witness, to be the observer, and also to go into the details of our lives. Because we can't live out there in the ethers. Right. I mean, right. I'm a Pisces, so it is <laughs> easy for me to get the Cosmo vision. I spent half of my life not in my body. <laughs> and once I learned to be in my body, I was shocked at how much wisdom there was and how many restrictions I'd put on myself. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely. And especially as women, that's something that I've been thinking about about a lot lately is, um, you know, I'll notice myself, for example, I'll notice myself sort of holding my, my tummy in a little bit. Uh -huh. Right. And I'll think, oh, my gosh, no, <laughs> like, like, let that baby hang out, you know, get that full breath. Well, there's the happy medium, you know, but it's like, it's a conscious retraining. Yeah. The happy medium, you have to balance health because you need a strong stomach for your core strength to keep your spine strong. And if you're doing it simply because somebody told you you'd be prettier with your stomach flat than you are with your stomach the way it is, you get to make a choice. Yes. So we all have a stomach. They're there for a reason. We need <laughs> them. They serve us. <laughs> Exactly. I've been going back and forth myself with um, not wearing any makeup at all, which I tend not to do in my ordinary life at this point, and wanting to be acceptable for the people that I hope to help raise their vibration. Mm. So there's a little bit of both. Some days yes and some days no. Some days I do a little bit of lipstick. Some days I just go bare naked face and it's it's kind of love it or leave it. <laughs> Take me or leave me. Not everybody's gonna like me but if you like me do you like me when I don't have lips or eyebrows? You know? mm -hmm. Well and to me that's part of um Part of doing work in which we are finding and cultivating and nurturing our tribes is to recognize that not everybody's a part of our tribe, right? And if, if someone, for example, I have this newsletter goes out every Monday and, you know, people unsubscribe from it and it used to zing me in an uncomfortable way. And now I see it as a refinement, like, okay, the way I was delivering this message isn't quite working for you. And you'll continue to search and you'll find the delivery mechanism that works for you. And that's totally okay. And I feel the same way about my appearance and, yeah. um, you know, being very open um, about uh, being queer and all these kinds of things. Like it's, 
It's just part of the discernment process where, again, there's no right or wrong. There's simply discernment, and that's great. Exactly. And the more we become ourselves, the more we express who we truly are authentically in public as well as in private, or maybe vice versa, the more people can choose whether they want to be with us or not. Mm -hmm. And if they do want to be with us, then that's a richer, deeper relationship. I mean, even if it's just an online relationship, even if it's just the 31 day good vibe challenge, if that helps somebody raise their vibration and then they've had enough, oh, get away from that woman. We've had enough of her for a while. <laughs> exactly. We want to be catalysts. We're mirrors yes. for everybody. Sometimes people like the mirror, sometimes they don't. Yes. But until, until I got comfortable with accepting myself, it was way too scary for me to give people the choice. So I would play the roles. I was, mm -hmm. I was a, an Olympic level pleaser. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> and I still know how to be kind, but I have boundaries now. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't even know what a boundary was until I turned 50, Sarah. Uh, I'm learning. <laughs> this is how far we have come socially and in consciousness just in the last few decades where we mm -hmm. have begun to discover the, the energetic pulses because a boundary is important to know where you stop and I start mm -hmm. and to know what we can be responsible for. When I realized that the word responsible, responsibility meant that you were able to respond. You mm. can't be held accountable for something that's outside your control. Mm -hmm. You can only be accountable for the things that matter in your own life. And then that ripples out. Yes. So that took a huge burden off. Yes, I could understand that. What what I'm learning now about boundaries, because I am learning how to set them and I'm learning how to honor them. And I'm learning particularly in the context of my, my relationship with my partner, mm -hmm. that when I set a boundary, there, there's an old people pleasing <laughs> part of me that says, oh, this is alienating and in, in some way divisive. And in my new consciousness, I'm able to say, no, what I'm doing is I'm sharing critical information with my partner about how I like to be loved and how I need to be treated. And that that puts us both in a position to have a stronger, a stronger partnership when we are each drawing our boundaries and teaching each other in the same way. So it's a, that's a beautiful thing. It sure beats this whole idea of, Oh, they've got to read my mind. They got to, <laughs> if they really loved me, they would know. Oh my gosh. Yes. Isn't that one of the most damaging lies that's ever been perpetrated? We, our communication helps everybody. It helps us to get clear on what we really want and need. Mm -hmm. And it helps other people give us what we want and need. Yes. Yes. And, and isn't that wonderful? Thing. When people really love us, they want to make us happy. They want us to feel supported. They want to know how what they do helps us expand more into ourselves. And then that pulls love out for us, from us for them in gratitude mm -hmm. to the role they're playing in our lives. Absolutely. So boundaries have had a bad rap, you know, because nobody wants to get a stop. <laughs> but sometimes that's exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. stop yeah. Stop telling yourself those stupid lies. That's not you. It never was you. Somebody mistakenly told you that. Mm hmm right exactly I love it so our our inner work and our expression of ourselves in the world are so deeply woven together mm -hmm. I think so too and I think it's all very courageous that's an important word doing this work requires us to be courageous mm -hmm. requires us to tell ourselves the truth requires us not to judge the truth, but to accept it and love it and work with it. Mm -hmm. So we have to 
Do you find that there's a certain amount of aloneness that's required for doing the deep inner work? I find there's a cause and an effect there. Or there's two sides of that coin where, yes, I think, I think the work of getting to know ourselves is inherently solitary on some level, though other people, as you had mentioned earlier, can be mirrors that help us see ourselves more clearly. And I think that's so incredibly valuable too. I, I wouldn't be where I was without so many really wonderful people helping me along the way. I also think that stepping um, more and more deeply into our own power and being more and more courageous also can lead to a sense of loneliness, not anything bad or desperate, but simply um, it's this discernment process as people fall away because they're not there with us or they don't understand what we're doing, then it can lead to a sense of, of loneliness at times. And, and again, I think that's a really valuable place to bring acceptance, you know, instead of saying, oh, I'm lonely, this is bad. Instead say, okay, I'm having a moment of loneliness and that's a natural part of the human experience. It's not only natural, I think it's essential. <clears throat> One of the, the ways that I work with myself is to remember that I came into this planet all by my own self. Mm -hmm. And essentially, when it's time for me to go into the next dimension, I will do it all by my own self. Sometimes the inner work does feel lonely. Yes. I would like someone to tell me what to do. Yes. And soul says, no, I have mm -hmm. to let it unfold. Yes. I have to see who you are in the unfold. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing because when we're growing, we may be growing ahead of other people. So they're not going to understand. They're not going to come alongside. Hopefully they'll be supportive, even if they don't understand. But we have to be willing to find the truth and claim it and then let other people take what they want from us. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, tend Another to agree. Way that I work with myself is to remember that even when I'm feeling my loneliest, I'm not alone because there are all these wonderful beings in other dimensions. Just because I can't see them, I can't sit on their lap or feel their hug, I can feel their love, I can hear their guidance and appreciation. And we all have them. We have angels, guides, teachers, animal allies, ancestors, all this multiverse of beings that's really cheering us on. It's all so much more complex than um, it gets into that complexity again. We want simplicity and yet it's very complex. And I love being at a place in my life where I rule very little out or very little in. Mm -hmm. I kind of go, oh, the universe yeah. is so complex. <laughs> well, and I find that freeing because if, I, if it had to depend on my understanding, we would be <laughs> Oh, this has been wonderful having a chance to talk with you about these issues that are so uppermost for all of us now. This is the kind of conversation that feeds me, Sarah. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for bringing your wisdom. And would you like to, to offer something to our listeners before we go? Um, you know, just a, um, a reinforcement of that reminder that we are each the greatest guides and the um, greatest experts of our own lives. Right, especially when we can discern, you know, again, discern the gremlin voices from that voice of inner wisdom uh, and find our way. And I would just love to encourage everybody to, to trust themselves, to, to develop their tools and develop that confidence and that courage uh, so they can trust themselves moving forward as this, this fantastic expert of their own growth and their own lives. I'm going to second that motion. For Thank you. listening. You can trust yourself. Yes. You have everything you need. Go do it. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Woo! Happy times ahead. Indeed. Thank you so much, Sarah. For oh, all of our you. listeners, we will put the information on how you can connect with Sarah if you're interested in going deeper with her coaching 
or her wisdom or her insight or just sign up for her newsletter. It's really very intriguing. I'm enjoying it all every Monday. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you having me. Sarah. It's such we'll a delight. Talk again soon. I'll look forward to it. Bye-bye.